Hello, and welcome to another webinar presented by Access. And we're very happy to have you as part of this webinar. Access is a firm believer in continuing training, and we create content that you can access anywhere, anytime, to help you succeed and grow your business. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give you a little background about Access. Access is a technology company that provides innovative solutions to health organizations to effectively run their business. Now, we empower healthcare organizations like yours with easy to use cloud based software that integrates all aspects of your operations so you can improve patient outcomes while growing your business. We're the fastest growing home health technology company in the country today, trusted by more than 6,000 healthcare organizations. Over 150,000 users log in daily, serving over 1 million patients nationwide. The most successful home health care organizations trust Access. Access has achieved many firsts in the industry. Now, we're the only healthcare technology company approved to award continuing education units, CEUs by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and also the most recommended home health care software by Software Advice. Now, we're the only company to have a native mobile app that works on both Apple and Android devices. And Access is the first software company approved to provide CAP services. Now, as promised, let's start today's webinar. Hello and welcome again. This is Jennifer Gibson, your trainer here with Access. And today we're going to discuss part four of 12 in our webinar series called Navigating the Highway of ICD-10-CM. Today we're going to focus on coding cardiac conditions, and I'm glad to be here with you as a certified OASIS and ICD-10 coder. Um, we're going to talk about home care coding as it relates to cardiac conditions today. So let's talk about our objectives for today. What are we going to learn today? We're going to learn why proper coding is important. We're going to learn who is responsible for applying and assigning the diagnoses. We're going to study guidance for coding circulatory conditions in ICD-10-CM, and then we will apply that knowledge to common circulatory home health scenarios. Let's first look at how coding relates to the OASIS C1, and in order to do that, we're going to consult the OASIS C1 guidance manual that CMS puts out. And we learn in that guidance manual that ICD-10-CM coding must follow the official guidance for coding and reporting. Now that official guidance comes from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and from NCHS, the National Center for Health Statistics. So this guidance is uh, determined by and developed by these two entities, uh, as well as some other entities as well that help uh, decide the best practices and how to use the code set. And that guidance is published yearly and then updated on subsequent years. And so adherence to this official guidance not only is uh, necessary for the OASIS C1, but it's also required under HIPAA, which as we know is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. Now, ICD-10 coding rules and sequencing guidelines have to be followed according to the OASIS C1 guidance manual. So the first thing to know is that in order to fill out your OASIS C1 properly, we must make sure that we are coding properly. And we are also told in the OASIS C1 guidance manual that the rating for symptom control on items M1021 and 1023, that rating for symptom control is not to be considered when we sequence the primary and secondary diagnoses in column one for those M items. According to the OASIS C1 guidance manual as well, the primary home health diagnosis should be the chief reason the patient is receiving home care the diagnosis that's most related to the current home health plan of care, and thirdly, only current diagnoses can be used for primary or secondary conditions or diagnoses. So what does that mean, a current diagnosis? That means a diagnosis that is currently being treated in some way. For example, if the patient went into the hospital because they had um, cholecystitis or gallstones and the physician or surgeon went in and removed the gallbladder, the patient no longer has cholelithiasis because that was resolved by the surgery. In that case, for home care, for example, we would not code cholelithiasis anymore 
as our primary reason for home care. Instead, we would be coding aftercare for surgery on the GI tract or the GI system. So that's what we're talking about when we say only current diagnoses can be used on your OASIS for primary home health diagnosis or secondary home health diagnosis for that matter. Now the secondary home health diagnoses that you begin to list in M1023 are comorbid conditions that exist at the time of the assessment being done and they are actively addressed in the plan of care or they have the potential to affect the responsiveness to treatment and rehabilitation pro prognosis. So in other words, if the patient, maybe you're out to see the patient because they have a stage three pressure wound on the buttock and the patient's also diabetic, but they know everything there is to know about their diabetes. It's well controlled. They know the diet. They know their medications. You review their blood glucometer log, and they're actually checking their blood glucose as it's ordered and so on. We would still go ahead and need to code diabetes because it is a comorbid condition, and it has the potential to affect the responsiveness to treatment because if that blood glucose happens to become uncontrolled or you start having elevations that will definitely affect the wound healing. So for that reason, we would need to go ahead and code diabetes and other conditions like CHF and hypertension and COPD and so on. Uh, and those would be our secondary home health diagnoses if they're not the primary reason for home care. Again, still consulting our OASIS C1 guidance manual, who can select diagnoses? Who's supposed to actually choose the diagnoses and how they're sequenced? Um, according to the OASIS guidance manual, it says the patient's primary and secondary diagnosis must be made by the assessing clinician. Only one person is responsible for assigning those diagnoses. The the clinician who sees the patient. The clinician, however, is expected to understand the patient's overall medical condition and care needs before they select the diagnoses. Now, where do they get that information? The clinician would need a lot of different information to help deduce which one of these diagnoses should be primary and secondary. They would need that from referral information, from documentation from the physician or the referring facility's records, and also, uh, and oftentimes, we even need to consult with the physician, uh, especially if there's something different on the face-to-face -face encounter, for example, as the primary reason for home care, and then we go out and assess that something else is actually the problem, there would need to be some communication between that clinician and management and even the referring physician because the diagnoses are based on assessment findings, the medical record, and input from the physician. So again, that plays into the whole coordination of care and making sure that the physician is involved in home care, which CMS is using that as a focus right now, trying to involve the physician more in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want to show that there's coordination of care between that clinician and the physician as to what diagnoses are chosen. The assessing clinician should then record the primary and secondary diagnoses in M1021 and 1023. And the one little gamut that CMS tells us that someone else can actually do, the coder can add the actual code itself after the assessing clinician has determined what the primary and secondary diagnosis is. So that's what we kind of need to think about and remember is that coder can only add the letters and numbers, but the clinician, him or herself, has to choose what's primary and secondary according to CMS guidance. So you need to really think about your processes and policies in your agency and how that works uh, and make sure that this is what you're adhering to. Now there will be times when the clinician in the field may not know enough about coding to really know uh, which diagnosis may go first. That certainly comes up. So your agency needs to make sure that you have policies and processes that will guide what to do in those circumstances. Perhaps the patient uh, is being referred to home health because they need nursing and PT uh, to manage diabetes and neuropathy, okay? And they have peripheral neuropathy, which is affecting their ability to feel the floor and they're tripping and rugs and falling and things of that nature. So you have PT and nursing going out. PT may be going more often. And so the clinician thinks, well, the main reason they're going is neuropathy.
but they don't realize that neuropathy is a manifestation code, for example. The coder knows that, but the assessing clinician does not. So the clinician may put neuropathy in 1021 and diabetes in 1023. So how do you handle that? Your policies and processes in your agency should dictate how you handle that. Um, but most agencies, what they do, they have a counseling form or a correction form where the initial response is recorded and then the changed response is recorded and then the two uh, come together, the coder and the clinician come together, the coder explains why this needs to be changed uh, and then they both sign off that they talked and conferenced and came to the same conclusion and yes they'll go with the changes that are made and that's recorded and or scanned and attached in the actual medical record so that CMS can see what the change happened and why it's different than the initial answers. But anyway, again, the assessing clinician should record the primary and secondary diagnoses and sequence them. The coder can actually add the code numbers and letters, and that's the only guidance that CMS gives us as far as coding. So if I'm a clinician in the field, I want to know what the coding criteria is. Uh, when I'm trying to select the correct code, what should I consider? Let's think about these points. Number one, the coding criteria must comply with coding guidelines. The diagnosis that I choose must comply with coding guidelines. Uh, I'm to code only unresolved diagnoses. I'm to code only the relevant medical diagnoses. Now, what do we mean by relevant? Relevant means that it's impacting what I'm doing or I'm actually taking care of this particular need in this uh, 485 plan of care in the episode in which we're seeing the patient. Uh, patients may have lots of medical diagnoses. For example, they may have an abnormal pap smear, pap smear, for example. Uh, but if I'm in the home to see the patient for CHF and wound care, that's not a diagnosis that's really relevant to what I'm doing, so I wouldn't record that. So again, the takeaway from that point is that not everything is relevant to what we're doing. Only the main reason that we're in the home and any comorbid conditions that might impact how the patient responds to the treatment that we're giving are really relevant medical diagnoses. We are to code only diagnoses supported by the patient's medical record documentation. And by that, we mean the medical record documentation from the referring party, the physician, or the records from the referring facility. That doesn't mean that I can take an HMP and whatever the patient tells me, I can just code that without confirmation from the physician. We do, again, need to make sure that we coordinate and have documented from the physician whether that be a verbal order where I've called and spoken with the physician and said, hey, patient says that they have heart failure. Uh, can you confirm that? Uh, they didn't know specifically what kind, if it's systolic or diastolic or whatever. And then record that you made the call, specifically whom you spoke to and their title, and then what your response was. Um, that is what we're talking about being supported in the medical record documentation here. We have to ensure compliance with sequencing requirements when the code set tells us to code first or use additional code and all of that. We have to follow those sequencing requirements. We need to also ensure etiology and manifestation codes are sequenced and reported properly, like we just talked about with diabetes and neuropathy. And then again, the last point, avoid nonspecific or ambiguous diagnoses and symptoms. Now the criteria for a primary diagnosis uh, we'll see here. Number one, it's the most related to the current home health or hospice plan of care. Number two, if more than one diagnosis is being treated, the primary diagnosis should be that diagnosis that represents the most acute condition and requires the most services. That's the one that should be assigned as primary. To help in that decision as to which is primary, remember it's the chief reason for home health or hospice and it requires the most intensive skilled services. And we remember that the primary diagnosis is not to be a Z code unless it's absolutely necessary. And if it is absolutely necessary to replace a primary diagnosis with a Z code or status code, we can still put the uh, code that it replaces over in 1025 if that's pertinent. But due to the complexity and specificity of ICD-10 code set, that is not going to be used nearly as much as we did that in ICD-9 over in 1024B. For example, in ICD-9, we would often have to put aftercare for fracture in uh, 1020, 
and then over in 1024B, we would have to actually code the fracture itself there. In ICD-10, we're actually coding the fractures, so we don't have to do that. So uh, in many cases, you will not have to use a status code primary and then put a partner code over in 1025, but it's there just in case, okay? When selecting a secondary diagnosis or diagnoses, we are to consider the following criteria. Number one, these diagnoses didn't meet the criteria for being a primary diagnosis. Uh, the secondary diagnoses selected are addressed in the plan of care and they affect the patient's responsiveness to treatment and rehab. And then we're going to list or sequence these secondary diagnoses in order to best reflect the seriousness of the patient's condition and to justify the disciplines and services provided. So for example, if the patient had a stroke and uh, they have dysphagia and dysphagia, and they also have some difficulty with uh, falling, and they have wound care that we're all dealing with. We're going to look at not only the diagnoses, but when we're sequencing those, it's gonna be dependent upon the frequencies of each discipline, for example, who's going out there most often, uh, which is the highest acuity, is the uh, dysphagia and dysphagia and swallowing issues, is that causing pneumonia? And if so, that's happening frequently, then the ST diagnoses may go ahead of the wound care, for example. Now that we've covered how to select primary and secondary diagnoses, let's talk about some general coding guidance. And we review this in every one of our uh, seminar topics here. So you've probably heard this already if you've listened to several of my topics on ICD-10 coding. But general coding guidance, no matter how seasoned a coder we are, we should remember to always apply these basic coding guidance steps. And number one is to always, always start in your alphabetical index of your code book first. Now the dash at the end of entries in this alphabetic index mean that additional characters are needed to complete the code itself. You're also going to see guidance in the alphabetic index that says C or C also. Remember that that is not a suggestion, but rather a command. And oftentimes the guidance, when you flip over to where it says C or C also, that guidance may be better or worse than the original entry at which you looked for the code. But if you look, don't go, bother to go over there and look under C or C also, you may miss something that helps you get a more precise code. So check the guidance at C and C also. Once you find a code in the alphabetic index, you want to also check that code in the tabular index. And you're gonna check for guidance then in the tabular under the chapter level, the chapter block level, the three character category level, and the final code level as well. Once you get into the tabular as well, you need to make sure you read your includes and excludes notes that are under the circulatory codes in this case. Uh, remember that there are many combination codes in the circulatory chapter. We don't have a hypertension table like we had in ICD-9, and there are special rules for hypertension with renal and cardiac disease. Patients who have both hypertension and renal, chronic renal failure specifically, or other cardiac diseases, we have to be real careful to apply the rules for coding those disease processes in ICD-10. We also have a change here as it has to do with myocardial infarction because that timeline changed. We're now going to talk about rheumatic heart disease and how that's coded in ICD-10. There is specific cardiac guidance uh, in the code set for ICD-10 that talks about rheumatic heart disease. And the guidance that we are told is we are not to code rheumatic heart diseases unless the physician specifies they're rheumatic in their diagnostic statement. What does that mean? Um, for example, valve diseases heart valve diseases. Quite often, those heart valve diseases can be caused by rheumatic fever, which causes scarring and all of that in the heart valves. But we can't assume that a person who has valve disease, that it's related to rheumatic fever. Even if you're doing a history and you ask, because you know that they're related, you may ask the patient, so did you have strep throat a lot as a kid? And the patient may say, oh, absolutely, I sure did. Um, and we took lots of antibiotics and sometimes I forgot or whatever. We can't go ahead and jump to the conclusion that because of that, they have a rheumatic heart valve disease problem. Instead, we might query the provider as needed to find out if in fact this is rheumatic in nature or not. But if we don't find out that it is indeed rheumatic, either 
through documentation or through our query and documentation in that case, we are not to code any kind of heart disease as rheumatic unless the physician specifically states that in their diagnostic statement. Now, in the rheumatic heart conditions, you're going to notice at I00 through I02 chapter blocks, those are for acute rheumatic heart conditions. Whereas the code block for I05 to I09, those are for chronic rheumatic heart diseases. So that brings us to another point. When does a condition become chronic rather than acute? And it's simply answered by when the provider specifies chronic in the patient's record. So basically in the guidance that we're learning, there are certain things that we cannot assume uh, unless the code set tells us to assume that there's a relationship here we are specifically told not to. Two things we've learned so far, we can't assume it's rheumatic, we can't assume it's chronic just because it's gone on for a period of time. That m both of those things must be stated in the physician's or provider's statement in the records. Okay, so we are not to use acute rheumatic fever codes for acute, chronic, infective, or other non-rheumatic pericarditis, endocarditis, or myocarditis. Uh, we can't use that unless, again, the physician states that it's one specific thing over the other. All right, now that we've talked about that guidance, let's talk about the hypertensive disease guidance. The chapter block for hypertensive diseases are found at chapter block I-10 to I-15. The main thing you're going to notice, and we've all learned probably at this point in our ICD-10 training, that the hypertension code is simply I-10. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> By the way, the code set that has caused our blood pressure to rise is actually the code for hypertension. I think that's kind of funny. But anyway, there is no hypertension table in ICD-10. Uh, you know, in ICD-9, you had a table, then you had to deduce if it was uh, malignant or benign and so on and, and, and really look at the table in order to find the right hypertension code. That's not the case in ICD-10. We don't have a hypertension table in ICD-10. But there are conventions at that chapter block. So if you're in your code book and you flip over to the section right above where it says I-10 hypertension, if you go above that, there'll be a little box and it will say chapter block I-10 to I-15. And just below that, you're going to find guidance as it looks just like on the screen here that says use additional code to identify exposure to environmental tobacco smoke or history of tobacco use or occupational exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, tobacco dependence, tobacco use, and so on. What that means is for every code that you use between I-10 and I-15, if any of these things apply, if they've been exposed to tobacco in the environment or they worked somewhere that they had a lot of smoking going on, they were exposed to tobacco smoke, we have to code that in addition to whatever hypertension or hypertensive disease we're talking about here. So there are some codes other than I-10 that get into more specific and we get into um, codes that are beginning to combine disease processes. One such code is I-11, which is hypertensive heart disease. Now at that three character category level, we learned that there's some guidance that relates to that. And one of those guidance pieces that we've learned in ICD-10 is that the provider has to document a connection between hypertension and heart disease in order for us to code I-11 hypertensive heart disease. What does that mean? We can't on our own assume, and the guidance tells us specifically not to assume, that if the patient has hypertension and they also have some type of heart disease, we are not to assume that they, those two things are connected and code it as I-11 hypertensive heart disease. Um, the provider has to document that con connection. So we also learned that the provider can state or imply that in their documentation. And what's the difference? A stated example would be documenting documentation in the records that say heart disease due to hypertension, for example. Or an implied example is hypertensive heart disease. So it just depends on how they write it, but as long as it's stated or implied in the record that those two problems are connected, we can go ahead and code that to I-11. Otherwise, we have to code hypertension at I-10 and then the heart disease I-50 to I-51.9 separately, for example. So while we cannot assume hypertension and heart disease are related, 
We can presume and should presume a cause and effect relationship if the patient has hypertension and chronic kidney disease. So if the patient has hypertension and chronic kidney disease and the provider does not relate the chronic kidney disease to another disease process, then we are to assume that they are related and code those here at I-12. Let's talk about an example of that. So if the provider documents in the records that the patient has hypertension and the patient has diabetes and they also have chronic kidney disease, but the physician writes that that chronic kidney disease is related to diabetes, obviously we're not going to then code hypertensive chronic kidney disease at I-12 because the physician or the provider has attributed that problem to diabetes and not hypertension. However, if the doctor just wrote that they have diabetes and they have hypertension and they have chronic kidney disease and the provider did not relate the chronic disease to either of those problems, then we are to make that presumption and go ahead and code it at I-12, hypertensive chronic kidney disease. Now you're going to notice when you code to I-12 and you're looking at the three character category level, the actual code I-12, hypertensive chronic kidney disease, there's guidance there that tells you use additional code to identify the stage of chronic kidney disease at N18.1 to N18.9. And that guidance means that right after the I-12 code, you must go ahead and put the N18 code identifying the stage. They have to be sequenced together. Okay, let's continue on with our cardiac guidance. When a patient has both a condition classifiable to I-11, which is hypertensive heart disease, and they have conditions that are classifiable to I-12, hypertensive chronic kidney disease, we are told in the guidance you wouldn't code an I-11 code and an I-12 code together. In other words, if they have I-11 plus I-12, instead of coding both of those, you do a combination code at I-13, which is hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease. Let's break that down and understand that a little better. So if the physician says the patient has hypertensive heart disease and chronic kidney disease, Instead of coding I-11 for the hypertensive heart disease and assuming and coding the hypertension and chronic kidney disease together as an I-12 code, we actually have at I-13 a code that covers all of that, and that's hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease. So just a quick way to remember that, an I-11 plus I-12 equals I-13. We only code the I-13 when both uh, I-11 and I-12 are in play. Now, at the category I-15, these are our secondary hypertension codes. Now, secondary hypertension is caused by an underlying condition such as renal artery stenosis, other renal disorders, Cushing syndrome, for example. Uh, we are told not to code I-12, hypertensive chronic kidney disease, when hypertension is noted to be renovascular. So if you're reading documentation from the provider or the facility and they say that they have renovascular hypertension, that's not the same as hypertensive chronic kidney disease and we're not to apply the I-12 code. Two codes are required to fully describe these conditions at I-15 because they're secondary hypertensions. We have to have a code for the underlying etiology like Cushing syndrome and then a code from I-15 which is your secondary hypertension code. So you'll notice that that three character category at I-15 that there's a piece of guidance that says code also underlying condition. So we know that we also have to code the Cushing syndrome and not just a secondary hypertension code. Ischemic heart disease is next on our uh, topic list and we're going to talk about the guidance as it relates to ischemic heart disease. The ischemic heart disease codes are found at I-20 to I-25 and there's guidance at that chapter block as well that tells you to use an additional code to identify the presence of hypertension. So if a patient has a diagnosis that falls in the I-20 to I-25 category, we are told to use the additional code to identify any of the hypertension problems that can be classified between I-10 and I-15.
We mentioned earlier in our preview that the acute myocardial infarction timeline changed. In ICD-10, it is now four weeks. So you can code an acute MI up to four weeks after it happened. However, that's quite different than ICD-9 in which the acute MI definition carried over to eight weeks. So after four weeks in ICD-10, you're going to code I-25.2, old MI, and then your atherosclerotic heart disease at I-25 if that applies. Otherwise, you just code old MI and keep moving. But remember, it changed from eight weeks in I-9 to four weeks in ICD-10. All right, we also have some specific cardiac guidance at several block categories that relate to tobacco. Um, and we'll tell you to use that additional code like we saw when we first started talking about the guidance at this chapter uh, at many of the three character category headings. For example, at I-20 for angina pectoris, you're going to see the guidance telling you to code if the patient has exposure to tobacco or environmental exposure and so on and so forth. You'll also see that at I-21 for your STEMIs and non-STEMI MIs. You're going to see it at I-22 for subsequent STEMI and non-STEMI MIs. And then I-25, chronic ischemic heart disease. You'll also notice that it tells you to use an additional code to identify any kind of tobacco use or exposure and de dependence and so on. That guidance will look as you see here in red underneath that category. It will tell you to use additional code to identify exposure to environmental tobacco smoke at Z77.22, history of tobacco use, Z87.891, occupational exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, Z57.31, tobacco dependence at F17, or tobacco use at Z72.0. While we're here talking about this guidance, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what's the difference between these different uh, categories. Exposure to environmental tobacco smoke means that somewhere in that patient's life, they were exposed to tobacco smoke. In my case, my father smoked from the time that I was an infant or newborn all the way up until I married and moved away from home. And he smoked in the home, and I was exposed to that for 20-some-odd years. So, of course, that's going to increase my risk of heart and uh, lung problems. So that would be a risk factor, and that's really what CMS is looking for in our NCHS health statistics. They're wanting to see... For example, which heart diseases could be tied to tobacco smoke and what are the statistics and cost and all of that related. So they want to use this information to help with statistical data in that case. And that's why it's important. It's also important for us to know as it relates to our patients, you know, did this just kind of happen or is it because they're smokers or they were around smokers and what's going on and remember that history as well. So exposure is somewhere in their history, they were around environmental tobacco smoke that was not at the workplace. History of tobacco use is personal history. They used to smoke, they quit. Occupational exposure means that they were exposed at the workplace. Back before we had a lot of non-smoking laws, uh, flight attendants, for example, uh, were exposed to tobacco smoke because they could actually light up on the plane back in the day. Can you believe that? I just can't fathom being trapped in a plane with a lot of cigarette smoke. But back in the day, that was commonplace. Maybe they worked at a bar, you know, where drinking and smoking went on and they were exposed to that as well. So again, that increases their risk for heart and lung problems. We want to know the statistics. We are told to code that. Uh, tobacco dependence and tobacco use, that is if it's still going on, the patient's still smoking. However, we can't code dependence without a physician statement but we can code tobacco use. Um, what I do tell people about tobacco use, you need to use some common sense about what you code and make sure you're coordinating with your physician. For example, quite often when a patient has an MI, they go into the hospital, maybe they were smoking, uh, the physician talks to them, they're scared, they agree, yes, I've got to stop smoking. Uh, they certainly can't smoke at the hospital, so they put them on a smoking cessation plan um, they may give them nicotine patches to use, for example, and all of that. The patient gets home a few days later. Um, they're having the cravings. They're not as scared as they were. They think they're going to be okay. Uh, you go out on admission and 
lo and behold, the patient's got a Marlboro just smoking away, right? Um, and the records say that the patient has stopped smoking. And you're just going to go ahead and put tobacco use. That could be kind of crazy. You need to make sure that you're coordinating with the physician, that your report, and of course nurses and clinicians, we would do this anyway because we know the risk between smoking and the nicotine and all of that. But make sure you document uh, give yourself credit for what we already do, but let the doctor know, hey, you know what? He's out here smoking right now. Um, do you want him to use the patch or not? Probably not. Do you see it? Educate the patient, whatever. But then also go ahead and go that step extra and say, is it okay if I then document tobacco use in this case? And obviously they're going to say, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. And then you can code it. But make sure you're connecting the dots so that it doesn't look like you're just assuming uh, information and adding it without having that backup in the records, okay? At categories I-21 and I-22, in addition to the tobacco guidance, you're also going to notice the fourth point here under use additional code to identify. They add status post administration of TPA or RTPA in a different facility within the last 24 hours prior to admission to current facility. Now, that doesn't happen very often in home care. I mean, it would be very unlikely that we get a patient to home health within 24 hours of them getting a clot buster drug to treat an MI, right? But if it should happen for any strange reason or you're not home care and you're listening to this webinar, you'll see that there is guidance to add a status code if they've actually had TPA or RTPA in a different facility than where they are today in the last 24 hours, okay? Also at category I-25, we notice there's guidance in addition to the tobacco guidance that tells us to use an additional code to identify chronic total occlusion of coronary artery, I-25.82. So those patients who are not uh, physically able to undergo stent placement for whatever reason and they have a chronic total occlusion of a coronary artery, we need to make sure we're adding a status code as well. Let's talk a little bit about our pulmonary heart diseases at this point. There's chapter block guidance at I-26 to I-28, and that chapter block includes pulmonary infarctions, pulmonary thromboembolisms, and pulmonary thromboses. Remember, the conditions that are at this chapter block, I-26 to I-28, they're usually treated for months. They don't just change and you know you don't get over those conditions in a couple days they're usually treated for months so remember we shouldn't change the diagnoses from an acute infarction or thromboembolism or thrombosis to chronic remember again the physician has to make that statement that it's chronic instead of acute a lot of those diagnoses as well we are told to also code long-term use of anticoagulants if that's applicable and once the pulmonary embolism, for example, once that has resolved, then you will need to continue to code a history of pulmonary embolism. All right, let's talk about other heart diseases. The chapter block I-30 to I-52 includes diagnoses such as pericarditis, endocarditis, myocarditis, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, heart failures, and valve disorders need to make sure at that particular chapter block or those conditions to pay attention to manifestation codes. There's a lot of code first instructions at the manifestation codes. Make sure you read includes and excludes notes as well. And if you're not real sure about manifestation codes and what all that means, go back to the first um, instruction seminar in the series where we talk about the different rules and guidance pieces and that will help you understand manifestation codes and which code goes first in a code first or the manifestation code as well. All right for diseases that are caused by infections you'll also need to code the causative organism. For example if heart disorders are not specified as rheumatic they should be coded to I-30 to I-52 block. And again, you can't assume you must have a physician or provider document exactly what's going on here. For example, at I-30.1, infective pericarditis, you're going to see guidance at that category and code level that says use additional code from B95, B96, or B97 
to identify the infectious agent. So they want to know what organism is causing the infective pericarditis. At I-43, there's a code, cardiomyopathy and diseases classified elsewhere, you will see guidance that says code first, underlying disease such as gout. So in that case, if they have cardiomyopathy due to gout, then the first diagnosis would be gout, M10.0, followed by the I-43 cardiomyopathy code. And the last point on this slide here, I-42.7, cardiomyopathy due to drug and external agents. It tells you to code first poisoning due to drug or toxin if applicable, or use additional code for adverse effect if applicable to identify the drug. Remember, the difference between poisoning versus adverse effect depends upon if the patient is taking the medication properly. With poisoning, that means the patient, for whatever reason, has taken too much medication or they've been administered too much medication. In order to know and deduce if this is poisoning versus adverse effect, you first have to know if it's prescribed properly, and then you have to be able to see how the patient's taking the med or how it's being administered. If they're getting too much medication, that is a poisoning. If they're taking it as it's prescribed, and it's prescribed properly, and they're having side effects, that's an adverse effect. And you'll notice that the sequencing is different depending on which is the case. If it's poisoning, you first code the poisoning, then you code the cardiomyopathy I-42.7. However, if it's an adverse effect, you code the cardiomyopathy first, and then you sequence the ad, uh, additional code for the adverse effect if it applies. So if, for example, um, the patient is taking whatever drug properly and they have cardiomyopathy due to that drug, you would code first the cardiomyopathy and then the adverse effect. Cerebrovascular diseases is next in our chapter. The cerebrovascular diseases are found at chapter block I-60 to I-69. This chapter block includes non-traumatic hemorrhages of the brain, cerebral infarctions, occlusions of arteries of the brain, and sequelae of cerebrovascular diseases, including sequelae of stroke. And remember, sequelae in ICD-10 is the same as late effects in ICD-9. It's the same terminology. We just call it sequelae in ICD-10. And that's important to know so that when you go in and look up the actual code for sequelae of a stroke, you're going to literally look for sequelae and not late effect. Uh, at the chapter block I-60 to I-69, you're going to see uh, guidance to use additional code to identify the presence of the alcohol abuse and dependence in addition to all that tobacco guidance that we were familiar with up to this point. So at this chapter block, we're adding another layer of statistical data, and that is alcohol abuse and dependence and how that relates to cerebrovascular diseases. So, again, just like with tobacco, you can't assume abuse or dependence of alcohol. doesn't matter if you go in and there's a case of beer and it's half gone and there's cans laying around by the patient. Again, you have to coordinate with the physician if it's not already documented that they are abusing or dependent upon alcohol. Coordinate with the physician. Tell them your findings. Ask may I code alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence, specifically write who it is you spoke to in their title, record the conversation, and then your guidance as to yes or no that you can code that uh, if it's not already documented. Now remember, acute strokes are not coded in home health care. We didn't code acute strokes in ICD-9, neither will we code acute strokes in ICD-10. And that plays back to that whole point that we made earlier about not coding resolved conditions. The actual stroke itself, the cutting off of the blood flow to part of the brain, that's an acute problem. Um, once that has happened, there's residual effects in some cases from the stroke, and that's what we're seeing the patient for in home care, uh, is the residual effect, the weakness, the paralysis, the difficulty swallowing, whatever's going on. So we're going to code the effects of the stroke in home health. Late effects is what they were called in I-9, sequelae in I-10. So when you're getting ready to code the late effects or sequelae of a stroke, you're literally in the alphabetic index going to look for 
sequelae stroke in your alphabetic index, okay? And then the sequelae is going to be an I-69 code. That's just a tip to remember. Sequelae of a stroke would always be an I-69 code rather than an I-63 or an I-60 whatever else. Uh, many sequelae codes in ICD-10 are combination codes, which is good. Um, it helps us to leave lots of room for coding uh, those top six diagnoses and other things that are more acute because we don't have to take up two spots for the coding uh, for strokes. But many of the sequelae codes are combination codes in ICD-10, so make sure you read the instructions at the code level and three character category level. For example, there will be guidance at some of those places that say things like use additional code to identify the type of dysphagia or the type of paralytic syndrome such as a locked in state. So make sure that you're not just focused on tunnel vision finding the code, but you're reading the guidance above, below the code, at the three character category level, at the chapter block level, and then at the chapter level to make sure that you're doing everything you're supposed to by using additional codes and so on and so forth. Let's talk next about some vascular diseases. In ICD-10, the diseases of arteries, arterioles, and capillaries are coded at the chapter block I-70 to I-79. This chapter block includes things like arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, dissection and aneurysms, Raynaud's disease, peripheral vascular disease, and arterial embolism. When you're at this chapter block, pay attention to guidance at the three character category level. You're going to see a lot of code first and use additional code. The use additional code, again, this is not an all-inclusive list that you'll find in your code book, but again, we're talking about tobacco use and exposure or severity of non-pressure ulcers as it relates to arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. Um, chronic total occlusion of the arteries of the extremity. Again, if there's no blood flow getting down there and they're having um, ulcers of the leg, you're going to have to code that chronic total occlusion of the artery of the extremity. Any associated kidney, acute kidney failure, for example, or chronic kidney diseases, you'll also have to code those according to guidance. Now, when you're coding atherosclerosis specifically, you're going to need to know the following information. So whether this be at referral intake or if you're the assessing clinician going out and getting information from the physician's records and you don't find it, this is clues that you're going to need to call and get more information. For atherosclerosis, you need to know, is the affected vessel a native vessel or is it a grafted from a bypass surgery vessel, for example? Are there any associated symptoms like ulceration or gangrene? Uh, which artery is affected if it's arterial? Which side is affected and so on? Those are things that you're going to need to know to code as specifically as possible. Now we also come at the end of this chapter to other and unspecified circulatory disorders. These are diseases of veins, lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, and not elsewhere classified. These nonspecific problems are found at the chapter block I-80 to I-89, and they include issues such as phlebitis and thrombophlebitis, thromboses and embolisms, varicose veins, post-thrombotic syndromes, and venous insufficiency. Make sure you pay attention to the guidance at the three-character category level I-82, other venous embolism and thromboses. You're going to see, for example, excludes two notes, which are like a caution light to you that you're not going to normally code these diagnoses that follow excludes two and those codes at I-82. And if you don't know a lot about excludes notes and excludes one and excludes two, again, go back to the first part of this 12-part series where we talk about the coding guidance because we do explain the difference between excludes one and excludes two guidance in that. But you're going to notice that there is guidance to help you understand what codes you're trying to code and whether or not that could also be coded with other problems such as intracranial venous embolism and so on, for example. Now, chronic embolisms and thromboses codes often have guidance to use an additional code uh, if applicable for associated long-term or current use of anticoagulants. 
obviously if patients have had embolisms or thromboses, they're likely going to be on an anticoagulant. And what the guidance is telling you is to go ahead and use a status code uh, that they are taking those drugs. Now, varicose veins of the lower extremities, you will see that you have to get specific as to I83.0 is the category with ulcer. I83.1 is the category where the varicose veins are inflamed, and I83.2 is where they have both an ulcer and inflammation. You're going to notice guidance at these particular code levels to use additional code to specify the site and the severity of the ulcer, and that would be an L97 non-pressure ulcer code that will talk about uh, the location and the severity, whether you're seeing fat or necrotic muscle or necrotic bone and so on. At I-85, with your esophageal varices, you're going to see also to use additional code to identify any alcohol abuse and dependence from F10. Again, we can't assume abuse and dependence. We must have a physician statement on that, okay? Um, then you're going to get down to I-95, I-99 chapter block. These are other and unspecified disorders of the circulatory system. These include things like hypotension, gangrene not elsewhere classified, intraoperative and post-procedural complications and disorders of the circulatory system that are not elsewhere classifiable, and other and unspecified disorders of the circulatory system. At I-95.2, hypotension due to drugs, you'll see that there's guidance telling you to use additional code for adverse effect, if applicable, to identify the drug. So if, for example, the patient has hypotension because they're having an adverse effect to their lisinopril um, and they're, you've deduced that the patient is taking it properly, taking the drug properly, is prescribed properly, and they're having the side effect, then what we're telling from the guidance is there's going to be a sequencing thing here. Use additional code for adverse effect means that hypotension due to drugs, then you would have the adverse effect of lisinopril, okay, for example. That's how you would code that, and those two things have to go together. So you need to make sure you understand and use that guidance properly. At I-96, gangrene, not elsewhere classified, which also includes gangrenous cellulitis, you notice, for example, there is an excludes one note that tells you we're not talking about gangrene and atherosclerosis or in diabetes or in hernia, so on and so forth. This is gangrene that's not classified somewhere else. Now remember the difference between not elsewhere classified or not otherwise specified, and this is covered in the first of this 12-part series as well. Not elsewhere classified means you have more information than you have a code for. So this is a specific type of gangrene. It's just not one of the types of gangrene that are listed here in excludes one, but you have specific information. Not otherwise specified, on the other hand, means you don't have enough information to really know if this gangrene is due to diabetes or hernia or atherosclerosis or whatever. And you couldn't query and find out within the five-day window that you had to complete your assessment. So that's a little bit different. Remember the difference between NEC and NOS. Excludes is like a stop sign, which means I can't code an I-96 code here with... Uh, an E11 gangrene and diabetes, for example, because that's two different disease processes. Let's now go into our practice scenarios just to kind of bring home all the guidance that we've learned today uh, and learned in prior sessions. We're going to do some practice scenarios and then talk about the answers that we have as well. All right, so the first one, our patient is admitted for treatment of hypertension and congestive heart failure. The patient also has stage 4 chronic renal failure and diabetes. Nursing will be seeing the patient for CHF management. In this case, we have I50.9, heart failure unspecified as primary. Then we have I12.9, hypertensive chronic kidney disease with stage 1 through stage 4 chronic kidney disease or unspecified CKD. Then we have N18.4, CKD stage 4, followed by E11.9 to cover our diabetes. Remember, we can assume and should presume 
the relationship between hypertension and chronic kidney disease, and instead of coding I-10 for hypertension and then the N18-4, we instead would code I-12, which is your hypertensive chronic kidney disease, and that's what we demonstrate here. There's guidance at I-12 to tell us to use additional code to state what stage of chronic kidney disease they have. That's why we followed N18.4 right after I-12.9. All right, the second practice scenario we have is a patient who was admitted following a non-transmural myocardial infarction one week ago. He had an angioplasty with stents placed in two coronary arteries, and he also has a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. In this case, because our timeline is four weeks, we can still code the MI, and we had information about what kind it is. So we have in our primary diagnosis spot, I-21.4 for a non-ST elevation MI. Then that's followed by E78.5, hyperlipidemia unspecified, then I-10, essential or primary hypertension, and then a status code, Z95.5 for presence of coronary angioplasty implant and graft. Now, if the hypertension is more of an issue than the hyperlipidemia at this point, you could sequence 1023B and 1023C. You could actually flip those and put hypertension higher than hyperlipidemia, for example. But remember our guidance early on that we are to sequence, unless there's guidance telling us otherwise, sequence due to the acuity of the disease process is going on. So there was no code first or use additional code guidance that would tell us we have to put hypertension next, so we would code those based on the acuity of the disease processes themselves. The next scenario, we have a patient admitted for teaching of disease process, diet, and medication due to coronary artery disease. The patient has a history of a non-STMI two and a half years ago and had stents placed in two coronary arteries. He continues to have controlled hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He's 5'8", he weighs 220 pounds. His physician documents no cigarette smoking and no alcohol use. So this is that same patient, maybe years down the line, you get them again uh, because they're having some problems with managing their disease process. In this case, the MI happened two and a half years ago, so it's certainly not within our four-week acute MI timeline, so we're not going to put MI first. In this case, it would be I-25.10, atherosclerotic heart disease of native coronary artery without angina. I-10 is the hypertension. Then we have old MI. Then we have Z68.33, BMI 33 to 33.9, and Z95.5, presence of the coronary angioplasty implant and graft. Now I see that I also left off here, sorry about that. You would also add the hyperlipidemia diagnosis uh, in the sequencing, and you could either put that after I25.0 or after I10. All right, the next practice scenario, you have a 50-year-old morbidly obese female who's admitted for management of pulmonary embolism due to chronic thrombophlebitis of the left popliteal vein. An IVC filter was placed, and she's on warfarin 2 milligrams every evening. She also has chronic asthma. In this case, we're going to code as our primary diagnosis I-26.99, other pulmonary embolism without acute core pulmonale. Then you have I-80.222, phlebitis and thrombophlebitis of left popliteal vein. E66.01, morbid, severe obesity due to excess calories. J45.909, asthma, unspecified. Z79.01, long-term use of anticoagulants. And Z95.898, presence of other vascular implants and grafts. Now, we'll go on to say that there's guidance at the E66 level telling you to use additional code to um, identify the BMI on the patient. We didn't have height and weight in the scenario, so I didn't add that. But uh, on your assessment, you would be able to get a height and weight and calculate a BMI. And then in that case, 
at 1023D before asthma, you would put the BMI right after the obesity code and then continue to sequence from there. The next scenario, we have a 76-year-old patient who is admitted for treatment of oropharyngeal phase dysphagia and expressive aphasia due to a stroke about a month ago. He has a history of hypertension, diabetes, stage 3 chronic renal failure, and takes insulin and warfarin daily. He has a history of smoking cigarettes, but he quit more than 10 years ago. We have a lot to code here, so let's look at this one. In this case, the speech therapy is going to see the patient more often than is nursing. We had to look at that with our review of the plan of care and sequence accordingly. So in this case, we have I69.391 dysphagia following cerebral infarction, and there's guidance at that I69 code to use additional code to identify the stage of dysphagia. So we had to get with our speech therapist and find that out to code R13.12, dysphagia oropharyngeal stage. I want to stop there for just a minute and bring up a, another good point. Whenever you have a patient who needs different therapies, remember we can only code the information that we have in that first five-day window that we have for uh, gaining information and assessing the patient. CMS gives us that, in, that window for a reason, and that's to coordinate care. That means that you need to get your therapist out there as soon as possible after start of care, but certainly within that five-day window. Otherwise, you can't use the information you glean from them seven to ten days later to help you with your coding. That's actually against the rules. So you need to make sure that you're getting them out there timely so that you can coordinate care and do what we just did, sequence based on what's going on with the patient, okay? So again, you have I69.391 dysphagia following cerebral infarction followed by R13.12 dysphagia oropharyngeal stage, then I69.320 aphasia following cerebral infarction, uh, we're able to connect and assume the relationship between hypertension and CKD. So code number four is I12.9, hypertensive CKD with stage one through stage four or unspecified CKD. We have uh, guidance that tells us to use additional code to identify the stage of CKD. So we have N18.3, stage three CKD. And then we have to put our status codes here the order of the status codes don't matter quite as much, but you certainly have uh, Z87.891, personal history of nicotine dependence, followed by Z79.4, long-term use of insulin, and Z79.01, long-term use of anticoagulants. Our next practice scenario, we have an 82-year-old female admitted to nursing services for wound care of her lower legs. She has varicose veins with an ulcer and inflammation of the left calf and an ulceration of the right inner ankle. She also has frequent falls due to muscle weakness and she fell last week with bruising noted to her left arm and hip. She has osteoarthritis of the knees and the hands. In this case, according to severity and the face-to-face -face encounter, that we have. We didn't mention that scenario, but our main reason for being out there is the wound care. So we have I83.222 varicose veins of left lower extremity with both ulcer of calf and inflammation. Then we have I83.013 varicose veins of right lower extremity with ulcer of ankle. Then we have M17.0 bilateral primary OA of the knee. M19.041, primary OA of right hand. M19.042, primary OA of left hand. And then finally, Z91.81, a history of falling. Um, in this case, what we're trying to show you is that there are some diagnoses that have bilateral. And if you can find a combo code that says bilateral, you only have to use the bilateral code. However, there are other codes in the system that don't have a bilateral. In this case, the arthritis of both hands, there was no bilateral primary osteoarthritis of hands. In that case, if it affects both, you have to code both as well. All right, your admission next on the next practice scenario, your admission is a 79-year-old male who has chronic systolic heart failure and cardiomyopathy. 
atherosclerotic heart disease and hypertensive CKD. He is morbidly obese with a BMI of 45. He has a history of smoking and he quit uh, smoking two months ago, as well as he has a history of depression and diabetes. The patient's assessed to be uh, needing teaching on his new ACE inhibitor, his new beta blocker, furosemide, and compliance with his diet. You've left a diet journaling tool in the home so you can assess his daily intake. Uh, PT and OT is ordered to assess and treat immobility due to the arthritic joint pain and low back pain. In this case, we have I50.22, chronic systolic heart failure. You notice we don't have a lot of codes for the PT and OT, and there's guidance in I10 that we'll get into in the musculoskeletal system that will uh, follow later. Um, but we are told that for therapy coding, you don't have to have any more uh, specific PTOT codes if the reason that they're treating the patient is related to another diagnosis. So again, if this chronic systolic heart failure and back pain is what has caused the abnormality of gait and the muscle weakness and all of that, we don't have to add codes for muscle weakness and all of that. We just code the I50.22 and that will justify our therapy services as well. So I50.22, chronic systolic CHF, uh, I42.9, cardiomyopathy unspecified, I25.10, atherosclerotic heart disease of native coronary artery without angina pectoris, I12.9, hypertensive CKD with stage one through four or unspecified CKD. Again, we made that assumption. We also have to use an additional code for N18.9, uh, chronic kidney disease unspecified. We didn't know, um, didn't have time to query in this case and find out. Um, the next code is E11.9, type 2 diabetes mellitus without complication. We have defaults that tell us if the type of diabetes is not stated, we will default to E11 type 2 diabetes, even if the patient is on insulin. Unless the physician specifically says it's insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, all you have is diabetes, even if they're on insulin, you are to code E11 codes instead, type 2. We then have uh, E66.01, morbid obesity due to excess calories. There's guidance at that code to also code the BMI. We had the height and weight in this case. We could calculate that BMI. Z68.42 is adult BMI of 45. Uh, F32.9 is our depression. Please don't code depression without a physician statement that they have that as a diagnosis. Don't just code it because they're on a medication for depression. That is not proper guidance, okay? You must have physician statement to support that they are actually depressed because antidepressants can be used for other problems such as anxiety or smoking cessation. You can't code based on a med list, okay? Uh, F32.9 depression. And the last one is Z87.891, personal history of nicotine dependence. All right, our next scenario, you've admitted a 69-year-old female who has end-stage hypertensive chronic kidney disease, atherosclerotic heart disease with angina, and anemia due to chronic kidney disease. The patient goes to dialysis three times a week. Nursing is to perform wound care for pressure ulcers of the sacrum and buttocks. Documentation from the referring uh, sniff states the sacral pressure ulcers started as a stage three two months ago and the buttocks wounds were stage three on the left and stage two on the right. At your admission visit, these wounds all appeared to be very shallow with no fat or non-viable tissue noted and fully granulated. In this case, we should have L89.153, pressure ulcer of sacral region stage three, followed by L89.323, pressure ulcer left buttock stage three, followed by L89.312, pressure ulcer right buttock stage two. We're in for wound care on this dialysis patient. So those should be our first three diagnoses. In the fourth position, you should have I12.0, hypertensive CKD with stage five CKD or end stage renal disease. That certainly is a comorbid condition that may or may not affect how this patient responds to wound care. We also know that the I12 code N18.6 should also follow the I12 code because of the guidance. 
And then we should have D63.1 anemia and chronic renal disease, followed by a status code Z99.2 dependence on renal dialysis. And then I25.119 atherosclerotic heart disease with unspecified angina. That's how we would code this scenario. So in conclusion, um, we've gone over quite a bit of cardiac guidance. We've also included in the scenario some of the principles we've already learned in the first few parts of our series on ICD-10 coding and home health. Uh, just know that part five of the webinar series is also coming soon. Uh, we're going to explore wound coding and home health, uh, such as surgical wounds, pressure wounds, stasis wounds, and more. That will be part five, and that will be coming very soon. So I hope that you've enjoyed um, learning with us in the first few parts of our ICD-10, navigating the highway of ICD-10 coding. And know that I look forward to helping you succeed even more as we continue through this web series. Thank you again for attending our Access Coding webinar series. If you have questions in the meantime, feel free to give me uh, a shout. You can contact me easily by calling uh, either my phone number here at Access, 214-575-7711. My extension is 3917. If I'm away from my desk teaching or, or traveling or whatever, you can leave a voicemail on that extension. However, the best way to reach me is going to be by email, as I can check that on a plane or wherever. Um, and that email is jgibson at access.com. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. I uh, hope you have a wonderful remaining part of your day. And I just want to thank you again for what you do for these patients who deserve the care that they are receiving in the home. Uh, no matter what your title is or what your position is, uh, whether you're the coder or the clinician or management or whomever, we know without you doing your part, you would not be able to support those patients who deserve the care that we provide at home. And we certainly know that's where they want to be. So thank you again for what you do. Have a wonderful day, and we we'll hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We know that your time is valuable and are happy you chose to spend it with Access. At Access, we're proud to offer a variety of training resources to keep you in the know on industry news and updates. You can register for additional trainings and watch on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, online manuals, and answers to frequently asked questions. We're always just a call or click away. Feel free to call us at 866-795-5990 or email us at support at access.com. All of our expert client experience representatives have a home health care background. They've been in your shoes and know the industry inside and out. Join the conversation and connect with us on our social channels. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on in the industry and share resources to help you grow your business and improve your patient outcomes. Thank you again for your time today and for choosing Access, your provider of complete home health care services, software, and solutions.